Well, thanks for tuning in to part two of the postmortem discussion, where we will pick up with some questions from the community around action items. Yeah, um, I just, I'm not sure, did you want me to tell that story? Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> just, just to jump back a little bit before we get onto those, those questions. Um, one, so, oh, I have a whole bunch of thoughts. You've been saying some really awesome stuff. Um, I first want to talk about the um, our, our our expert who was really good at this um, that we were trying to learn from. Uh, one of the things that I noticed he was really good at was asking seemingly obvious questions just to get detail about how things worked. He would ask very simple questions like, "Oh, well, how did the data get from there to there?" or, or "You know, where does this process run?" or just very simple I know nothing and he's he was one of our principal engineers he knew how it all worked but he would ask those questions of the group and get that full detail out and I found that super useful and I think it takes a certain uh confidence in how you're perceived in order to ask those questions um I, I often find it really hard say saying oh I don't know um because I, I I can worry that how people are going to perceive me uh, afterwards um so I think it's one of the really useful parts of, of facilitating is being comfortable asking those those baseline questions. Um, one of the things I also asked him was, was what parts of the timeline he thought were interesting in advance, like what what bits had he picked out? And I would ask him that every time just, be, just to find out what, to try and get sort of a intuitive understanding of what he thought was interesting so I could try and emulate that. Um, so I think it's a really useful thing to ask people when you're watching them facilitate. Um, but going on to the the, the question I asked in a, in a post-mortem, it was my it was my favorite postmortem. I loved it so much. It was just a fantastic session. Um, I need to paint sort of the timeline a little bit first. Uh, so we've got uh, two engineers and a, a tester involved. And one engineer is, is really new to the company. He's only been there a month, maybe two months. The other one's been there for well over a year. Um, and the tester is new to the platform as well, although they've been with the company a long time. And uh, these two engineers, they're deploying some code. They test it in, product, in the test environment, everything's fine. And then the, the engineer has been there a long time. He has to go interview someone. He's like, oh, can you finish deploying this to production for me? I know that's a lot, but it's, you know, we've tested it. It's, it's got no impact on anything. It's, you'll be all right. And they're like, yeah, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll test it. I'll, I'll deploy it to production and everything will be good. And that person disappears. Um, and they deploy to the pr production and they're like, oh, okay, I think this is good. And then one of the testers, somewhere else goes, ah, sorry, it's uh, it's breaking. My, my apps aren't working anymore. Something's gone wrong. And it was it was spreading through our apps. Like every time someone logged into one of the apps and we've got uh, five and a half thousand apps uh, published at the moment. So we've got quite a few um, and it's starting to spread. Every time someone opens an app, it's, it's breaking it. Um, and we're at this point in the timeline where I turn to this person who's really new to the company and is suddenly owning this this deployment. And I, I turn to him and ask him, so what, are you, what were you feeling during this? And he's like, oh, well, it was okay. And then one of his teammates who was in the room in this facilitated post-mortem room with me turns around and says, you told me it was the worst day you've ever had with Push Bay. And I, that just, the whole room suddenly changed. Like there was this moment where everyone was like, oh, oh, you were having an awful time. And this, you could just feel the empathy growing. Everyone was like, oh no, of course you were panicking. Like you were new. This was not your code making this change. You didn't know the platform. And this is your first big incident. Of course, this is terrifying. Um, and the awesome part about this incident is that immediately the team rallied around, like the team lead came in. Uh, he managed to stop this from impacting any more apps. I think it got to 100 apps. And then they quickly worked on a rollback and that was out within like half an hour. It was an awesome incident response. It was so quick. But I think one of the one of the key moments was was taking this uh, this emotional time for this engineer who had been in this really scary predicament. Um, and the whole team just sort of supporting him and moving him forward and making him feel a lot better about it. And I was really glad that someone else told me that he was feeling that way because he wasn't ready to admit that to the team. Uh, not in a big, he was like, oh no, in hindsight, it was fine. Um, but someone else was able to come forward and, and really paint the actual picture of what was going on. And I thought that was just my favorite moment in all of my postmortems. You, you know, when you told me that story the first time, I've heard it before. I 
but I just now I got chills when you tell that story. Did anybody else get chills or is it just me? Sue, do you have a story um, similar? Because I feel like you've had some so interesting moments as well. Um, feel free to pop in here if, if uh, there's any. Sure. Uh, yeah. It was it's uh, I actually wrote down what Richard wrote where he was talking about. And this is probably hardly paraphrased, but like the human tension. We we put our human tension in technical terms. And and when I first started facilitating postmortems um, and I and I and I, I asked a question about like what was going on at the time, like when you were trying to troubleshoot that thing, like what was going on? And they were like the engineers at the time were like, what what do you mean? Like it was sunny out like they didn't they couldn't put those two worlds of communication together um, because it it f maybe felt to them that it didn't that those questions didn't belong in the room and. And uh, and and I think that that just sort of that breakthrough when you have, you know, there were a few engineers who would be like, no, I was like scared as bleep, right? Like, they 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 would open it up for everybody else to be able to talk about their feelings, but with a lowercase f, not a capital F. Um, and I feel like uh, when when. It, it depended on the team. It depended on the specific people in the room. Um, our operations folks uh, tended to be in a lot more incidents and in a lot more postmortems. And so they became very used to that kind of conversation and that kind of sharing. Um, and and just it's almost like I wanted to stage them like, can you, you, you weren't involved in this outage, but can you come to this postmortem? Because like people need to be able to open up and, and you are that uh, feelings facilitator for lack of a better term, right? Um, so, uh, as, so, so Doc, I love hearing that story. It's so wonderful when you can get folks to open up um, and, and, it opens up the conversation to even the more deeper technical stuff as well, right? Like, here's how I made that decision at the time. And yes, I recognize that my humanity was involved in that decision, like in a big way. What I, what I like to do in, when I'm in a post-mortem, uh, so thinking of post-mortem is at the start, I like to say something along the lines of, um, we hope, you know, everyone will feel safe to share. And that actually it's the things that you may feel the most awkward or most embarrassed about. If you can share those, that's probably the things that people are gonna learn the most from. So we try to say that at the start of the session to give, try and give people that feeling that they can do that. And then the other visualization I get when we talk about reaching a point in the conversation and then taking sort of freezing it and going trying to go in different directions like how are you feeling what else is happening i kind of liken that to i try to meditate from time to time and part of that is about listening to everything that's coming through your head um your physical sensations what your brain's doing what you can hear what you can smell and that kind of idea of just sort of reaching that point in time and going in all those different directions because that's where you get a lot of extra context from and that's where you can take the conversation into the, the more human realm and and not just in this sort of tech realm. Yeah. I, I love the word feelings facilitator, okay? Uh, that is fantastic. Can you please uh, register that domain, domain name yeah. right now? <laughs> Um, but it's so interesting too, because it's like, um, so, so the, to the comment about sort of the senior leader who, um, you know, m makes it safe for others to ask questions by asking the questions first, you know, I love that. I love that when I see, and I'm starting to do this more and more is, um, when someone uses a piece of jargon that. Uh, you know, I don't know, or, you know, we love acronyms at Microsoft, as you may be aware. And it's like, well, can you just, you know, for my 
own clarification because I'm new here. I play the new, you know, it can still play the newbie card, like I think two years in at Microsoft or something. But basically, it's like, um, you know, everybody probably knows what this is, but I don't, you know, do you mind? But by setting that example, I think that makes it, um, you know, goes a long way to make it safe. Now to Tom, I want to come back too, because you said something great, which was, you know, and this is in the Etsy guide as well. It's like, what are those opening statements? You know, when we come into a room to have, you know, a postmortem or to have meetings around after accident, whatever you want to call these meetings, um, I, I just am so interested in the the things that we can do. Um, so sometimes as a facilitator of, of just all kinds of different meetings and different workshops, um, it's hard for me to point and say, what is it that I'm doing in that room that's making people safe? Because I've barely met them or or something. Um, and it's it's like I, I I'm excited about these ideas of like doing it. Let's check in before we begin. You know, wh why are we here? Um, what's the purpose of this meeting? The purpose of this meeting is to learn um, all that we can from this accident. Um, and, you know, we have to, the, the timeline, but let's now like walk through the lived experience and like the idea that you can create those, um, you know, experiences where people can share those things. There's lots of groundwork you have to do to make that possible, but you can start. Anybody can start, I think, is what I'm hearing from a lot of you. You know, of course, not everyone has that sort of emotional intelligence or, or maybe that's not the right word, but sort of way of being like a, a presence like a calming presence you know um it, you know it, it's just this notion of what are the things you're doing to make it safe for people to describe the, the lived experience um it's just very key i think we um we also try and say what we're what our session's not we're not necessarily there to find root cause or any sort of cause and we're also not there to think of what we call mitigations or action items. It's purely about what we say is it's purely about learning from each other and hearing everyone's perspective and experience. So I think that helps people, especially if they haven't been part of one before, to differentiate it from other such meetings they may have been in in other situations or other times. Yeah, I. Um, I'd add something to this, and it fits, I think, with the with the um, both. It makes a connection between um, the action items and uh, this um, understanding of of um, how we are uh, feeling about what's going on and the way that that evokes uh, responses in us. Uh, I, I take action items and the, not not the items themselves, but the need to process a list of action items and to make that the output as a kind of uh, psychological ab reaction to the event, which is based on the idea that there was this kind of normal state before the incident occurred. The system was fine. And then this incident occurred and we are now in a not fine state. And our goal is to get back to the OK state, the, uh, where, where we believe the system is normal and, and in its balanced uh, OK condition. And the action items are a way uh, of, uh, of sort of being done with the event. They're a way of putting it behind us, of being able to say we've completed what we need to do. That no longer has relevance for us. And I think that the psychological imperative here is very much built into a kind of management imperative, which is in order to be done with something to move forward, I have to be done with something from the past. I have to finish this and move forward. I have to, I have to be able to draw a line and then go on to the next thing. And I think that that's interestingly enough antithetical to this whole notion of learning. And learning is a, largely about remembering. And remembering means to be able to appreciate the circumstances and situations, to admit the incompleteness of our action collections, to be willing to live a bit with the uncertainty and the hazard that surrounds this. Because if the list of action items takes us back to the normal, then this will never happen again. We can go back to whatever it was we were doing before. Whereas if we see those as incomplete or, or insufficient, 
um, then there's this residual uncertainty about how the system is going to behave in the future. What's going to happen next? Are we really at risk? It can, fa can it fall over like this in some tomorrow in some way? And the answer, of course, is yes, it can because the system is dynamic and changing and we're adding to it in ways that constantly uh, open new paths to failure. So I, I think in some ways the, the emphasis on, on generating lists of action items and getting, uh, uh, and, 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 and sort of getting people will call this closure or something like that is, is, a, is a mistaken belief that somehow we can manage ourselves into a situation where we control the system. And our control is adequate and sufficient to be able to stay, say that the state of the system is now corrected. And I think that the demonstrable experience is that isn't correct. I mean, you can think that and you might even feel that way for a while. But as um, as Richard Feynman said, you know, reality has to take precedence over public relations because nature cannot be fooled. And that's certainly true here. You can you can do all this stuff, but the system is still going to turn around and bite you the next day. And I, 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 I really do think that um, somehow the, the, the uh, let me tell you a little little uh, example here. We, we have some experience of an organization where we were talking about the fact that people prepared list of action items before they came to the PM and came to the PM with their list of action items in hand, which meant, of course, that the learning and understanding and analysis of the event had happened before they got to the room, right? You couldn't develop the list of action items unless you knew what broke. So they they just they figured that all out ahead and they were just coming to the postmortem to get that list of action items registered and okayed. But but when you look at this process, you go, well, what's really going on here? Does every event have a bunch of action items attached to it? And the answer was yes. There's a certain minimal number of action items that have to be listed in order for us to have done our job. And they actually had gotten to the point where management was looking at what was coming out of the postmortems and counting up the action items and making sure there was a sufficient number. Well, you can do that, I suppose, but I'm not sure it's really going to turn out well for you. And, and so I would much prefer to see a, a, a postmortem that generates very, very few action items than one that has a, a sort of this metronomic quality of always stamping out, oh, we've got, here are our seven things to do. Here are our 12 things to do. And that, that's especially true if people come into the, um, into the PM with an action item in mind. One of the ways you could turn that on its head is you could say, okay, we only are going to list action items that have actually arisen from the process of discussion in the postmortem. Right. You can have all sorts of things that you want to do or things that you think need to be done. There's always a list of that stuff. That's great. But you carry that around with you. You bring it into the room. We're not interested in that. We're interested in the new stuff. So what came out of the discussion that now was a, an area where we realized there was an opportunity that we needed to seize? And I, I might even separate those two into different classes, right? There's the action, the, the stuff that we want to work on and that we understand and it's already there. And then there's something happened in the PM when we, when we realized that there is some new opportunity for us to make the system better in some particular way. That's an interesting event. And I'd be more interested in those than I would in the other list. That's just the big, you know, the big archival thing. By the way, mm -hmm. um, one of the most disheartening experiences that you will ever have is to go back to all the action items that have been generated in the past year and make a list of how many of them have actually been acted upon. Because what you will find in most organizations is that it's 20%, if you're lucky, 30% is an exceptional number. 15% is not uncommon. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that the action items are the action items are ways of make uh, they're kind of a salve that we put on our wounds to make us feel temporarily a little better, like we've ga gained some control. It's just nonsense. Richard, well, can I, 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 I would, Oh, go ahead. I was just going to add to what Richard was saying, and 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 I think that um, right, we're, quite often what happens is that action items or remediation items or follow up or whatever um, they're spoken about as if all of them. As if the number is as if they're uh, non-unique. Sometimes you'll see, well, this is a long term versus a short term, or this is complicated or this is not complicated. Sometimes what you'll see is 
somebody will say, oh, we should do this, this task or whatever. And somebody will say, oh, actually, you know what? Next quarter, we're doing this legacy thing. So it doesn't make sense to actually do this because it's going to be a moot point or, or say, oh, it's, it's already in progress or something like that. Um, I think one of the one of the things that we should consider, organizations should consider, is that one of the reasons why these action items that are logged aren't acted on, because maybe they're just not very good. And that the generation, what fuels the generation of these is not so much the the aha moments. Um, sometimes those the ones that have are fueled by the aha moments are the ones that we find are generally done sometimes without a ticket between the end of the incident and the postmortem meeting. And the reason for that is engineers, they, they can't wait. They say, holy crap, that was a thing. Jesus, all right, you know what? I'm gonna go do this, this thing because I do not wanna wake up again tonight or he's gonna have this tomorrow, blah, 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 blah. Very rarely are those counted as a remediation item or an action item, right? Um, the the thing the last thing I wanted to say about action items is that the 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 reason why we put in the guide this separation right this idea that the the dialogue in this, uh, a group meeting is uh, has a uh, has the potential to be generative meaning you can leave that conversation with different understand ideally you leave with different understandings than um, than when you went into it. And separating those in time allows people to stew on this, right? To pressurize the, we got it, we've got an hour. And because quite often what will happen is, you know, hey, everybody, it's 45, you know, 45 minutes into it. We better, let's stop with the, you know, timeline and let's get to remediation items. Oh, so. that's never happened. I, I love um, the way we do this at PushPay because um, we we handle things a little differently and we kind of always have for us. And if an action item can't be completed in a day or maybe two days, then it's not an action item. It's something that goes on the backlog and we schedule that into our like our, our planned work because uh, it's a, it's going to be a large piece of work. So so we we discard large action items that, that can't be completed, which I, I really like. But we also um, have noted that sometimes you don't need an action item. Sometimes there's not an action item you can you can have. Um, and that's, that's something that's okay for us. Um, and we've also started saying in our, in our intros, like, yeah, we, we're not doing action items here. We're going to go through the timeline. We're going to talk about what we learned in the timeline. And then you as a team can meet up tomorrow and you, got, you can talk about it. You don't need a facilitator to come up with that. Um, do that in your own time. It's not not something we're doing here. And I, I just I really like how we do that because yeah, we, we've had some postmortems come through and there there isn't an action item for it. It's like we're going to talk about it and we're going to learn some stuff, but there actually isn't something we can we can put together here. We just we uh, just learned a bit more. I have such a uh, wanted to uh, ask a follow up question because you know we I I've heard that and I talk with people about that to try to like understand where their head is in this and and so when you say that you have postmortems where there are no action items, would anybody else benefit from like some generic examples if, if anybody could share? Or is that something like as, you know, smart people in this call, like, is that something we should try to help people with in the sense that like, what I, I'm imagining a conversation where I'm, I'm trying to like, create shared understanding with the person who believes that action items are the thing. Like we can't get to like, I can't immediately change their beliefs, but what I can ask is like, are there things that I can point to that could resonate and maybe they, maybe a light bulb or like, huh, you know, uh, talk to me about that if anybody wants to chime in here. I would say uh, one thing that comes to mind, there are a handful of rhetorical and they are truly really rhetorical uh, tips and tricks. Um, uh, you know, I think focusing on quality of or influence, you know, what, what, not quality, quality is a terrible word, but sort of um, what makes a good action item, 
right? Do they vary? Having the conversation about how they might vary um, might be might be useful because if it if and w- what goes into generating an action item that makes a difference. Talking about the the sort of where they come from um, might lead you to think, oh, the quality of the 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 the, uh, the contrasting of people's different mental models, uh, the the quality of the discussion, maybe. Um, time to think about it, probably. Um, so these are these are uh, these are reasonably good conversational routes. One that I would caution you to. I will tell you about, but wanted to caution you about um, uh, because you have to deploy this in a, very carefully. Um, when talking about what makes a good a good action item or uh, not a less good action item, um, one question is to is to I mean think about uh, how products are usually developed. Um, how many? Uh, let's say you had an incident and it was six months ago and you put together five or six action items, you did them. How many outages did you avoid because you did those? It's, a, it's an unanswerable question, but yet it's the denominator, right? It's the denominator, six. It's the cost of doing the action items versus the benefit. I mean, it, so it's an unanswerable question, but yet it is the sort of, um, it is a basic, and this is why I say you have to be very careful um, because then you might find yourself in a, uh, uh, a uh, and engineers love to talk about abstract economic analogies. Um, there's not enough coffee in the world to fuel them. Um, but it is a, it is a, uh, it, it, it is, uh, there are things that you can do to, to generate this. So Thank you. I think it's interesting because I've, I've, I've heard conversations that go um, almost in the converse, John, where they will say, um, oh, we had a repeat incident and I looked up those action items and they weren't done. So that's why we had the incident. And right. And so like, I love when you point to white space um, or, or that that blank space of how many did we avoid, right? Um, it's it's uh, it's it's the it's the white space on the on the right hand side of, a, of every poem, right? That speaks just as much as the words on the left, right? So um, so it's I, I run into that a lot. Um, there's a there's also a, a sort of cyclical process here that that is. Um, um, a reflective process that that happens. The way we understand incidents, the way we understand their sources is shaped by the kinds of things that we think we can control. Uh, If you look at accident reports for aircraft crashes, you will never find gravity listed as a cause. And um, there's a good reason for that. You can't do anything about it. Um, It's a, a given. But but in the tech world, especially as, as evolving as rapidly as it is, what constitutes the givens is a really complicated mixture of stuff. And, and so we tend to look for problems that we can solve and our collection of things that we can, that, that the tools that we have and the opportunities that we have tends to define the scope and the, and the surround of what it is that we are going to explore as we explore the sources of incidents. And I worry a little bit about this because the the scope and the and the capacity of the organ of, of the people in the room is is often quite limited compared to the realm of the things that can contribute to that event. And and it's a it's a mistake to imagine that we've somehow now defended ourselves against future events because we've done these three things that we made as a, a, a the you know that we included in our our list of action items, but those are the ones that we have, the ones that we can control, the things that we can get some grip on, some purchase on, 
And and so I think for, for me, being able to separate the understanding of the event and its sources from the generation of action items is important. And it's one of the reasons, Doc, why I was so impressed with what you said. Um, the ability to do that, to be able to separate out the, the generation of understandings and the inquiry from the creation of collections of things to be done is, is I think, really important. And just putting some just putting a little space in between that, just even a day is probably extremely valuable. I know John and his prior work sometimes would get would have two meetings. One meeting was to understand what happened and another meeting was to decide what to do about it. And those were held at different times and sometimes had different people attend them. And I think that that um, that that the tying so tightly of our notion of success in incident uh, postmortems to this list of action items, while it may make us feel better temporarily, it's it's not a it, it's not a, a nourishing sort of process. And I think we should try to dis disconnect those two if we can. Um, it, several of you spoke about this notion of repeats. Um, and I want to just touch back for a second um, to make sure I've kind of like grokked it because, you know, I heard, um, uh, I think Richard mentioned, um, you know, that or someone mentioned that there's these repeat incidents. And if only we had done X, Y, and Z and, you know, and that, and it is this, per, you know, pervasive concern, well, you know, uh, we're just, bad at doing our completing our repair items and never the deeper systemic question of are they how did you even arrive at these like and and this notion that learnings as like a noun uh like a thing that occurred already by the time you talk about the incident like what are the learnings as though those were some object that you could point to rather than the thing that's always happening and even continuing to learn during all these subsequent meetings. So by necessarily, how could your action items be even um, stand the test of time? If, mm -hmm. you know, uh, they're still being added to, to get under the wire, to meet this meeting or that meeting, I'm just, you know, generalizing, um, mm -hmm. you know, people that have told me, you know, industry, you know, communities have asked me these kinds of questions. So I just wanna ask again, there are repeats, or this perception of a repeat. And then there is this notion that no two incidents are alike, but like at some level, there's lessons to be learned that do apply. So could, could and, and I, I know Richard has given me some, like he's explained this to me once, I need to ask it six times to really like, if you could, if anyone in the call could talk a little bit about repeats versus, uh, you know, Things that feel related, et cetera. Um, I, I have to, uh, unfortunately, I have to drop off the call. No worries. We've been, uh, we can talk all day long and we can, can do this can, another I, episode. <laughs> I want everybody, uh, everybody continue yeah. to stay on. I'm going to drop off. Richard uh, certainly can, um, says uh, smarter things than I do. So, um, uh, Tom and Duck, thank you for, for talking. I'm, I'm Sue, we'll see you soon. Nice to meet you, John. Thank, yes. thank you. Thanks, John. everybody. Thanks, everyone. Um, well, Richard, do if you um, if you don't mind uh, talking about this uh, for another couple of minutes, I'd love to get my, my burning question answered. But I'm also happy to, uh, you know, uh, you know, if so, if we're um, yeah. So, so um, is it, it? Can you have multiple failures that come from the same sources? Well, surely, because the number of things that can contribute, you know, in, in different patterns are very often the same sorts of stuff. Um, I, I think that that uh, uh, it's possible to build little bits of defense in that can move um, uh, the locus of failure to a different place. And that's very much what we tend to do, right? We we defend against this particular pathway. Once that defense is in place, then that generates uh, uh, the opportunity for other failures to occur in other places. Um, I, the manifestations of an event are different than its causes or its sources. And, and um, 
uh, in, in some ways, this is the difference between the phenotype and the genotype, if you will. You know, the phenotype is the outward manifestation of something, the way it looks. And the genotype is this is the is the sort of machinery underneath that generates that that outward manifestation. Um, I think it's pretty safe to say that there are no repeats. And the reason I'm, I'm pretty confident in saying that is because your systems are no longer uh, deterministic or static in any meaningful way. And so, uh, you know, it becomes almost uh, you can't put your uh, toe in the same river twice kind of problem. I mean, the system is always changing. If not the code that you are running, somebody else's code on which you depend or the sets of circumstances that are, exist in the network that generate the kinds of traffic patterns that you see, all of those things are in constant flux. Are there places where you have vulnerabilities that, that are pretty wide open and that generate lots of opportunities? Absolutely. Uh, and and one, of the, one of the most wonderful things about distributed systems is uh, we don't know what those are until we run them for a while. Um, distributed systems have this, uh, this kind of quality of we bought all this, this flexibility and all this opportunity to, to manage the, the kind of, of, of variability in the world by building a distributed system. And now we made ourselves also vulnerable to that in particular. Um, so I think that, that um, the idea that there is a repeat is probably um, uh, puts the emphasis in, in, the, in the area that I'm not uh, seeing as particularly productive. Because the repeat, the way, the way that that is usually used is that someone has failed to take action in a particular way. And that failure is why we are here. And we're right back into the blame process again. What I do think is, is, is the case, though, is that there are patterns across sets of accidents, which if we can understand them, will help us better understand the functioning of the system. And, and you will see this happen, that the patterns will shift over time. There'll be patterns that are related, for example, to um, the, the aging out of an architecture that no longer supports building onto it the kinds of things that we're now putting there. And then you'll change that. Uh, around and you'll you'll enter a new regime and the quality, the flavor of the events will change. Definitely there are patterns here and understanding the patterns across incidents is one of the key things that you'd like to be able to get from this collection. Unfortunately, we don't do very much of that. And the part of the reason is because we treat incidents as a sort of atomic events. There, there's the beginning, the end, there's the stuff in the middle, we fixed that, now let's move on. Um, we, I, I think we're sometimes I, I sometimes think of the tech world as being a bit like um, those nature movies about the elk and the wolves. You know, the elk are in this herd and there are wolves on the edge. And every once in a while, an elk gets drawn, brought down by a wolf. You know, oh, it's a terrible thing. And what does the herd do? It moves a little further down the valley. It doesn't go hunting wolves. You know, they don't get together and say, we need, a, we need a posse to take care of those wolves. What they do is they just move a little further along. And, and I feel in, in the tech world that we're, we're very often doing that sort of thing. We're like elk. We're kind of really not sure what's going on out there. We don't really know about it, but we know there's bad stuff over there. We're trying to be as far away from the bad stuff as we can. But we're not thinking about it at this at this somewhat deeper level to try and understand what the real patterns of vulnerability are and what the real consequences of managing systems the way we are are. This the way we manage our systems is a, it sets up the opportunity for us to have these signals sent to us from the system about how things really work out there, not how we think they work, but how they really work. That's what what incidents are, right? They're little messages. They're in code. But their message is getting sent to us from the system saying, oh, you might want to look over here. Uh, may I draw your attention to this thing over here, says the system. And we look at those things and we say, OK, I, I now see what broke there. Let me go back to what I was doing. Well, maybe we should be paying a little more attention to what this, these patterns are telling us. And I think that's hard to do because our, our you know, we're elk, right? We've, we've got this problem. We've moved a little further on. OK, now let's go back to grazing. It just doesn't, it, it, it's not a very productive sort of activity. 
when we start to take deeper looks, uh, looks across incidents, we begin to see more of this. And I think that, that then we begin to see that there are patterns in, in the uh, collections of events that we have, but they're not straightforward. It's not because we chose the wrong language. It's not because we're working in Go rather than C++. I mean, it's just not the source of the thing. And, and you know, I, I think that this becomes clear if you can take a, a long enough view. There's my part. Go ahead. Um, one of my favorite things about this sort of topic is actually something you said, Jessica, uh, at DevOps Days. Um, I'm pretty sure it was you in one of your talks. Uh, but it was looking at... Um, looking at the success the same way some people look at, at failure and that people think there's that, that one thing that caused a failure. Um, and if you, if you apply that thinking to successes, is there one thing that, that means your, your platform's up and running and successful? And there's, there's not. And when I, when I tell engineers that they immediately go, Oh, of course, there's, there's a lot of things that contribute to success. There's a lot of different things that contribute to a failure. And I, I open all my facilitated prismons with that sort of analogy now. Um, to make them make them sort of think about that so that we can get into the, the deeper understanding of, of what's going on. Um, and I think when you're looking at, at, at repeats, uh, there's never going to be the same collection of things coming in and, and influencing a, a postmortem. And I think one of the, the key influences that people often don't think about is, is, is the observers affecting the system. So if, if uh, a, a director or a VP or a C-level comes over to you and goes, what's the update? You're suddenly going to be like, oh, no, <laughs> I am so nervous now. Uh, <laughs> and that's going to that's gonna change how, how, how quickly you can respond or Absolutely. what you're thinking about. And that's going to affect your, your incident a lot. And so thinking about those more cultural uh, effects on, on your incident is also going to change exactly how your incident uh, progresses. And, and that's sort of the difference between a repeat and an individual event. They're all going to be individual because every cultural setting who's working on the incident and who's observing the incident is going to change it. So it's, it's going to be new every time. I'm glad you brought that up because again, you, you know, even observing a system changes the system, right? You can't, there are no, you know, and I like to believe sometimes like I can like dial into an incident and, and, you know, no one sees that I, you know, I really, it, maybe there's a way we can observe without, you know, influencing, but it's unlikely. And then to your point about, well, uh, please point to the root cause of your success. Like I completely stole that from John who could, you know, uh, but it, it really is. Well, if you are so damn certain that you uh, can find a root cause for this nasty outage, like, and point to the thing. Okay. Please then now, uh, what's keeping it running today? What's the root cause that your site is up running right now because you won't be able to point to a single thing and in the same way incidents just um you know those 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 things that are repeats are you know or that people call a repeat it sounds like um those are things that you know get people back into that blame cycle very easily because it's like well they had they didn't do the things you know so therefore it's a belief that they would have prevented this now new outage but isn't it true that um, you have absolutely no way of knowing if your repairs uh, prevent something because you can't measure the absence of something, right? Or, or, or there's some notion that the measurement, you know, you'll, you'll, Richard, you'll say this more eloquently. It's something about, you know, the way we're measuring the absence, you know, the presence of this versus the absence of that is just so key. Yeah, I think one of the things that's very common is that we tend to think of of failures as being special case um, circumstances, whereas successes are general case circumstances. That is, we think that failure and success come from different sources. When in fact, the and this goes back a long ways. Ernst Mach, the uh, uh, German uh, mathematician, observed it. He said, "Success and failure flow from the same sources." And at a large, in a larger sense, that's the case, and and we're constantly uh, uh, having to relearn that. But the problem, of course, is that that's un, it's unpalatable to say, oh yes, 
the efficiencies that we have and the speed with which our system is able to, to make new changes and generate new stuff is purchased at the price of having these kinds of exposures to these different forms of failure, it's not a very satisfying way to argue after the event that's just brought you down for 12 hours and cost millions of dollars. But it's true. And I think this is a this is part of the difficulty that we've had, not just in in the world of, of computer software and hardware, but throughout. This has been true in medicine and aviation. It's been true in uh, virtually every domain that we've looked at. Uh, the, this difficulty with being able to understand the sources of success and failure. I think one of the questions that you will get in in uh, uh, in some PMs is why is it that this normally works or why does this this approach usually solve the problem or why is it that we don't usually experience this and when you begin to to dive into that a little bit and look at it more closely you realize that there are tremendous numbers of things that are built into our systems that are are essentially um, things that we depend upon to work in that particular way, and most of the time they do. Most of these trade-offs end up being good ones. Uh, why didn't you have another 300 VMs running when this particular event occurred? Well, yeah, we could, but it will cost us a little bit of money to do that. Oh, well, we want, we want, we want to be profitable at the end of the quarter too, right? So, it, it, and, and, of course, once the event has occurred, when we look back in hindsight, we can easily identify trade-offs that were that that now seem to have been bad ones. I think I think you, that we get into the process though of trying to when we're when we're trying to deal with postmortems. I think one of the keys here is, is to be able to sustain the activity over multiple events and to make it into part of the regular practice. Um, and, and to, to, to regularize and routinize that as part of the, 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 what it is that we do means that the system that we have is now inclusive of that. You know, we often talk about systems as though they're the stuff what I call below the line. That is that, you know, the collections of programs and hardware that's running out there. But the system is actually the people who are doing this as well, because they're constantly involved in tweaking and changing and adding to and modifying and correcting and all those things. And and so the boundaries of what you consider to be the system are, are often, uh, I think, too narrow. We want to include all the people in this. And part of the system is this PM and constant learning. And when we adopt that perspective, what we are saying is the world is going to behave badly. It's going to behave in ways that we cannot anticipate. Our circumstances are going to require adjustment. We're not going to be able to produce something that runs all on its own and just we just walk away from. And integrating this whole process into the system is crucial. And places that don't do it, they end up with very brittle systems that are very hard to maintain. They, they have lots of difficulty understanding what's going on. There's the, even lots of signals that come out of those kinds of systems. What Duck and Tom have been describing is a different approach. And, uh, you know, maybe partly that uh, I'm not sure what the reasons for their success are. I'd like to I'd like to understand those a little better. I think part of it may be they have enough distance from uh, from things by virtue of their physical location that they're actually able to see things more clearly with a kind of perspective that that that's hard to get in some other places. I think it's they they actually have been very thoughtful and deliberate about trying to import some ideas and then test them and and build on them in this constructive way, this iterative way, rather than saying, oh, we need a policy and let's write a big book. They've been able to iterate around developing a set of approaches and modify and adjust them in an ongoing way that makes them productive in their environment. And I think that's a really crucial idea. I, I, the thing I most worry about when we talk about postmortems, when we talk about incidents and analysis and all the rest of that stuff, is that people begin to think that there is this magic way that if we just do this, everything will be fine. And there is no magic here, none, zero. It's a lot of it is just working out the details locally and building a system that functions at this level and then being willing to sustain and to modify it. And that's what I think they're, they're telling us about is how to do that. That process 
is really the crucial thing that produces the results. It's not because they use the Etsy guide or they devote 35 minutes as opposed to 20 minutes or that they, none of that's, those are, those are what we might call implementation details. Have you ever heard that term? Implementation yeah. details versus the architecture of what they're doing is, a, is an important distinction. And I think that they've actually understood and got the architecture. Yeah, I feel like um, right from the start, our, our engineering values have been about continuous improvement and learning from failure. And what we've done over the last year with facilitated postmortems is really just a refinement of what was already really solidly in place. Um, we've always had a, a culture of doing that. So um, I guess we're pretty lucky we, we haven't had to start ourselves from scratch or or turn, change a bunch of already established practices where I, I feel like I was more refining them. And, or as you've sort of said, that iterative approach to things, yeah. Yeah, well, I was, I was jumping in can't just to- the ocean, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, was, I was totally going to come in and talk about our, our values. Yeah, our company values continue as the innovation, like continually innovate. Um, it's strive for excellence, um, and it's it's led to us um, simplicity is another one. So like taking someone else's process and and adapting it for our our needs is is something that completely fits with our values, and it's it's really led us to um, this this path, which I think is a really good one. We've we've never never stopped and said, well, that's it now, that's, we're done, that's, that's perfect, we'll never change that, that's, that's never been our way, we're, we're constantly changing things and improving them and adapting them, and um, I think that's, that's crucial for, for this experience, because it's going to be different for every single organization, and, and change over time, because every organization changes shape as, as time goes on, you get different people, different teams, different makeups, and it's, it's going to be different how you solve things. Sure. And then you also, you know, you have people um, changing roles and changing companies and, you know, this, this, uh, you know, potential, um, you know, of bringing these, you know, ideas, not cargo culting, but, you know, like, hey, let's look at this thing and then like, let's make it our own. Like, let's, let's do a, something that's really us. It's got that, you know, uh, you know, the the feeling, the DNA of push pay in your postmodern process will be different than what's at Microsoft and what's happening at Fastly. And like, I think that's really, um, you know, my point is that that is the beauty, right? That's the beauty of this is that it will look different for each of you, your incidents, you know, those kinds of things. People have various struggles. Many of them are the same. Um, and I think existentially like we're all kind of dealing with heavy very important ideas here that that really do impact people um so that's what i'm most excited about i guess is you know um i guess spreading that message that yes there are tools and tips and resources out there but there's also you know, this notion that you have to chop wood and carry water. You have to build a thing that's yours. Otherwise, it will never feel like yours and it will feel like something that's imposed. And, you know, that's this, you know, to me speaks to this notion uh, of asset based community development where you're looking for the good and amplifying the good, um, which is just uh exciting to me. Um, well, as I said, you know, uh, some of my favorite people, I love meeting new people. And, um, um, and so you and I and all of us on the call could, you know, easily talk all day. I do hope that we will do this again. I, I do hope that, you know, we can, um, you know, schedule another not a podcast for, you know, yeah. I don't know, two months from now or something. Let's, just, you know, check in. I think this would be fun uh, because as, as um, you know, John helpfully mentioned, I, you know, I don't think any one of us can only speak for 23 minutes. You know, it just feels like a thing that will continue. I like this to be a, a, a living conversation that, that um, you know, um, is, is, productive for, for folks. Um, and so with that, I do want to um, think about closeouts. And what I mean by that is, you know, if each of you has a, um, you know, resource, if you could, you know, maybe remind us your website uh, name, um, URL, um, any 
resources that you want to point people to or any, you know, if you're hiring, you know, um, you know, any kind of uh, roles like that. So I will um, I will ask Duck to go first with a with a closeout for us. Yeah, um, it's been really great talking to everyone. I've, I've really appreciated this. Um, I I would mostly just point to the the facilitation guide. It really got me started on thinking about how I could adapt those processes for my own work and, and input my own sort of stories into what I would say um, and how I would and, and get things started in a in a post mortem discussion. Um, where so I work at Pushpay. Uh, we're hiring at the moment. Uh, we're hiring QAs, testers, uh, SREs in. Uh, Auckland and we're also hiring in uh, Redmond as well. Um, we have a cross cross team in, in both locations. Um, I think Tom has the details on, on where to find our, our job listings. Yeah, our, our site's pushpay.com and it, it's fairly easy to find the careers page on there. So, yeah. Very cool. And um, you mentioned Auckland and Redmond. Do you also um, hire remotely as well or not at this time? No, no, not at this time. I'm curious. <laughs> Lots of people ask. Yeah. 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 No, no remote at this time. Okay, okay. Sue, uh, kick us off here with your closeout. Uh, sure. So, uh, favorite resources to um, Google or uh, go onto YouTube and search. I've done this on my lunch hour quite a bit for uh, Richard Cook, David Woods, Johan Bergstrom, John Alsbaugh, and um, it tends to be a really easy quick way to get folks uh, to understand this complex world of joint cognitive systems, um, at least a little bit to sort of wet their whistle a little bit. So that's one of my favorite things. Uh, my name is Sue Alspa Pomeroy. I work at Fastly. We are um, hiring at the moment. I think we're always hiring and we are a very remote friendly and worldwide company. So we're at fastly.com. Very exciting. Richard. Well, Cook. thanks very, thanks very much for having me. Um, uh, it's it's always exciting for me to hear what people are doing, um, uh, and and it's also um, so it's quite humbling to to hear how people have have grappled with the problems that they're dealing with and 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 created success. I I, I don't have any good resources to recommend. I'm I'm sorry. I, I'm fresh out. Um, um, but, I, but, I have uh, so many that you've given me. I, yeah. I know that all. Yeah. I I I think um, my my feeling is that that what we are hoping to do is to create a uh, an environment that values learning over the assignment of blame, and and I think that 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 it's proven to be quite hard to do in many different domains. But I think that uh, in your world, it's possible. I think that it's easier to start out small. And for people who want to do this, the one a bit of advice that I would give them is to to start relatively small. Be um, don't don't and and don't pursue the huge major event as your first case. Learn how to do this by starting small, practicing, iterating, understanding what's going on. Ask for help from people who've done it before. Um, recognize that some days will be better than others and some events will be more productive than others. And then try and step back from those experiences and ask yourself, why did that go well? What else could we have done that would have made it even better? And and be willing to learn yourself about how to do this. No one became expert at this be, the, the day that they finished their um, uh, training in computer science or the day that they got uh, you know their first job. Everybody learns how to do this from practice. And the more practice you get, the better you will become. You know, it's it's amazing to me that we don't expect people who, in terms of coding and developing code to come in and be productive at a very high level on the first day. No one imagines that you that that completing your course in, in, in training it makes you into an expert who can now write large systems. We don't we don't make that assumption. We understand it takes years to develop those skills. Why should it be any different here? Why should this be any different? 
It's not. And so consider that you're going to be in this for a while, that you've got a lot to learn and make make uh, uh, and your initial efforts relatively modest, learn from them and keep at it. And if you get stuck, you're having some difficulty, you can't seem to make things work, give me a call, we'll talk. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, well, I'll close out and uh, just with my um, deepest uh, gratitude to, to each of you for taking the time uh, with with me today and letting me record and, you know, so that, you know, more people can can learn from your experiences. Um, uh, I, I'm excited for people to, you know, go out and check out the guide if they haven't seen it already. Um, I'll encourage people to, you know, follow um, folks on Twitter. I know that I learn a lot from the, the different things that people share in that way. Um, for my closeouts, I will, um, uh, I want to give a quick plug to Lund University in Sweden to where you can, um, maybe you're not going to be able to do a master's degree yet uh, in this, but I will say that they offer this week-long learning lab that is lovely and it is just filled with brilliant people in every industry you can imagine all grappling with safety and and just culture and grappling with second victims and grappling with just this and uh and it's very affordable um so check out lund university they have a, a learning lab in human factors and safety science um uh, and with that, you know, my name is Jessica DeVita. Um, I'm with Azure DevOps. We are always hiring. Um, we, uh, it's, I think our jobs link is aka.ms forward slash DevOps jobs. Um, we also have uh, some incredible SRE uh, practices being um, developing here at Microsoft. And uh, I know the SRE team is always hiring. Um, and, you know, we have uh, worldwide folks in, in Dublin, we have um, folks in Germany, uh, here in Redmond, and, and just everywhere else uh, that you can imagine. Uh, so follow uh, folks on Twitter. Um, I'm Uber Geek Girl on Twitter. Um, Richard, you are R-I underscore Cook on Twitter. Um, Duck, you are Duckalini on Twitter, if I've got that right. Um, and Sue, I believe you're Sue Allspa on Twitter, is that right? And Tom, are you on the Twitters? I'm not on the Twitters. Okay, well, we'll see if in three months I can convince you to go. Um, now, there's some good judgment. <laughs> <laughs> um, come on in, the water's fine. I only like tweet about human error like once a day. Um, because that's not a thing. Um, well, anyway, so again, uh, I'm Uber Geek on, tw on Twitter. Please uh, share any questions that you have. I'll have some show notes, I imagine, with some of the closeouts and resources. Um, and with that, again, uh, my gratitude to each of you. And um, thank you for sharing and learning. And uh, just all the best to you. And, and happy happy holidays to Thanks to for all. getting us together. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks.